look like I got all that sunny below my oh, right, hold on, it's in here. That is stark. Damn it, what I just say? So I better not get any on my sleeve. What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, hi. My name is Jessica and every week I sit down here with you and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if you're interested in true crime or you're interested in makeup or you're interested in some combination of both like I am, then consider subscribing and liking this video. However, if what I do here isn't a combination that you're into, I get it. I know it's not for everyone. I don't talk about the makeup at all, so feel free to ignore the video and just enjoy my words if you prefer. But if the concept as a whole is a hard pass for you, you can pop down to the description box. For your convenience, I've listed some other creators that have covered today's story in a way that perhaps you may find more palatable. You are welcome. And with that, I think I've said all that I need to say. So what do you say I quit yapping and get into today's case? Okay, so today's case is wild. Have you guys ever heard of Rosendo Rodriguez? Well, if not, buckle the fuck up because you're about to get real familiar. But before I formally introduce you, let's hop over to Texas circa 1987. Joanna Catherine Rogers was born on June 25th, 1987 in Lubbock, Texas to her parents, Kathy and Joe Bill Rogers. She was a happy, vibrant, loving girl who enjoyed school and church. She was a member of her school's drama club, debate team, and student publications group. And as a teenager, she worked part-time at a restaurant and she volunteered at a local wildlife rehabilitation center. So clearly she was quite an ambitious person that likely would have lived a very happy and successful life. However, sadly, those who knew and loved her would never get the chance to see all that she could have done. Because in May 2004, Joanna disappeared without a trace right out of her very own bedroom. She was last seen by her parents late into the evening of Monday, May 3rd, when she got home from work. Even though she frequently got home from the restaurant close to midnight, she always made a point to stop into her parents' room and to talk to them, tell them about her day, and to give them a kiss goodnight. Everything about Monday, May 3rd seemed totally and completely normal in the Rogers household. Even at 3 a.m. on Tuesday, May 4th, when Kathy and Joe Bill woke up to what sounded like a door in their house closing, they brushed it off as likely just having been a random noise that one of their dogs had made. It wasn't until four hours later that Kathy would realize that the sound that had woken she and her husband up might not have been their dogs after all. It was about 7 a.m. when she walked into Joanna's room to wake her up for a dentist appointment that she had that morning that Kathy realized, despite the fact that her daughter's coat, wallet, car keys and cell phone were all still in her room, presumably where she'd left them the night before. Joanna herself was gone. And Joanna was not the type of kid to just take off without letting her parents know where she was going, which made Kathy pretty sure right from the start that something was very, very wrong. And that fear only intensified when she began calling Joanna's friends and her boyfriend in hopes that maybe they could point her in the right direction, but apparently no one had seen Joanna since the previous day and no one seemed to have any idea of where on earth she could possibly be. So Kathy called and officially reported her daughter missing to the police at around 9 a.m. that morning. Now, even though Kathy was adamant that Joanna would have never left like this on her own volition, police did initially classify her as a runaway, telling her parents that they shouldn't worry and assuring them that she would likely come home soon and everything would be totally fine. I cannot even begin to tell you how much this shit pisses me off. If you have parents sitting in front of you telling you point blank with 100% certainty that their child would not run away, then why do these good old boy officers still always insist on classifying these children as runaways? If the first 48 hours after a child goes missing are the most important, 
then why do these stories always seem to have police that are like so quick to just dick around during that time frame and assume these kids ran away? To clarify, that's not like a blanket statement regarding all law enforcement. I'm simply venting my frustration at how often it is in these stories that kids are haphazardly misclassified as runaways and then they turn up murdered and the police are like, Whoops. Anyways, Kathy was certain. I mean, there was not a doubt in her mind. Joanna had not run away. She was responsible. She was happy. She was a well-adjusted girl who loved her parents and had an idyllic home life. There was not one person who knew Joanna personally that believed for even a second that she would have run away. Because of this, her closest family and friends took it upon themselves to band together, spread out across Lubbock, and begin searching for her all on their own. They hung up posters with Joanna's picture on them. They went door to door asking if anyone knew anything. They mailed flyers to surrounding areas in hopes of spreading awareness regarding her disappearance. I mean, they truly took matters into their own hands and ran with them. And seeing this, police really started to second guess their classification of Joanna as a runaway. If this many people refused to believe that she'd run away, maybe they'd been wrong. And by Friday, May 7th, the Sheriff's Department had organized their own volunteer search party consisting of 500 members of the community that came together with the sole purpose of hoping to locate Joanna. The search party was made up of Kathy, Joe Bill, Joanna's friends, her extended family members, and members of her church. It seemed like everyone who'd ever crossed paths with Joanna was worried about her and hoping to help find her and bring her back home safely. The only person not present for these searches seemed to be Joanna's boyfriend, Marcus Lee. And rightfully so, this raised a lot of eyebrows within the community. I mean, when someone goes missing, you would think that the person who was romantically involved with them at the very least would be present for the search efforts, if not spearheading them themselves. So the fact that he didn't even show any interest in trying to figure out where his girlfriend was, was definitely more than a little sus. Unfortunately, these community-wide searches, thorough as they were, consistently turned up no helpful information. So eventually an Amber Alert was issued for Joanna and a $15,000 reward was offered for any information leading to her safe return. Kathy and Joe Bill even went on the news and begged the public for help finding their daughter. And even though this did end up generating a lot of public interest in Joanna's case, and it even ended up generating some interesting leads. But even as Joanna's name became known statewide throughout Texas, the amount of time that was passing without her return was rapidly diminishing any hope that Joanna would ever be seen alive again. Because of this, police began to treat her case as a homicide case rather than a missing persons case. Unfortunately, this did mean that they would have to look into and question Kathy and Joe Bill, which I'm sure was uncomfortable for everyone involved. But they totally understood that this was just part of the process. So rather than wasting time being offended and outraged, they simply did what they needed to do to clear their names so police could move on. They answered questions, they took and passed polygraph tests, whatever police asked of them, they were ready and willing to do in order to help move the investigation along. And because of their cooperation, they were cleared as persons of interest almost immediately. From there, they moved on to people that maybe Joe Bill had crossed through his job as a private investigator, thinking it was likely that there were probably people he'd looked into that weren't exactly his biggest fans. So it kind of became a running theory that maybe one of these people had taken Joanna as revenge for whatever information Joe Bill had brought to light about them. But after chasing down these leads, police found themselves no closer to finding Joanna than they'd been when they'd started. And this really only left one last straw for police to grasp at, and that was Joanna's boyfriend, Marcus. Investigators had found it super weird that Marcus hadn't participated in any of the searches for Joanna. He hadn't gone out of his way to provide police with any potentially helpful information. And overall, they just really didn't think that he seemed all that upset over the fact that his girlfriend had gone missing. So they called him in and they pressed him for answers and um, he did not make a good impression. He was hostile and angry and 
barely cooperative. He showed signs of deception when he took his polygraph test. And throughout his interviews, police really started to think that they might have their man. That is, until Marcus nonchalantly mentioned that he couldn't drive. The only way that he was able to get around was on his bike, as in sickle, a bicycle, which made it hella implausible that he was responsible for whatever had happened to Joanna. Sure, he'd been a pain in the ass for police to deal with, but even so, it just didn't seem realistic that Marcus would have biked the six miles from his house to Joanna's in the middle of the night, done whatever to her, and then, what, slung her over his shoulder and pedaled away with her? No, once they found out all of this, they pretty quickly realized that they didn't have the right guy. They figured that his failed polygraph was likely just because he was nervous, and Marcus himself later explained that his hostility towards investigators was due to the fact that they kept asking him the same questions over and over and over again. And after a while, it just really started to piss him off. But when all was said and done, Marcus Lee was cleared of any and all suspicion, and the investigation was brought right back to square one. They were out of ideas, they were out of theories, and they were out of leads. And over the next year and a half, Joanna's case would go ice cold. So now we have to fast forward to September 2005. We're still in Lubbock, but now we're at the city dump. Tuesday, September 13th, 2005, while screening the day's trash loads for hazardous materials, one of the landfill employees noticed a decently new looking black suitcase that just seemed out of place. It looked like it was in too good of condition to have been thrown away. And for some reason, it really piqued his interest. So he made his way through the sea of trash over to the suitcase to take a quick peek inside. And as he unzipped the bag, he was absolutely horrified to discover a set of human toes staring back at him. He immediately reported what he'd found, and by 11 a.m., the Lubbock Police Department, as well as their forensic team, had stormed the landfill and gotten to work. The medical examiner and the crime scene specialists carefully photographed and documented the suitcase, as well as the body, while the investigators began combing through the landfill for evidence. Which, can you even begin to imagine? Put aside the fact that it was incredibly lucky that the landfill employee even took the time to look at the suitcase before it was buried under dozens of additional tons of trash. But now police are combing through over two years of literal garbage spanning over almost 300 yards with the hopes of coming across items that may be important to their case. That is a level of patience that I have not and likely will never achieve. That had to be so tedious. They were doing it, and it didn't take them long to determine that the murder had likely not taken place at the landfill. Rather, that the suitcase had probably been transported to the landfill with the body already inside of it. Which meant that if they could find out where the suitcase had come from, they could likely find their crime scene. And if they could find their crime scene, they would have a lot better chance of gathering quality evidence from there than they would from a vat of the entire city's trash. So while they worked on that, the medical examiner got to work on trying to identify who the victim was. The body was obviously that of a female in her late 20s, early 30s, who had suffered one hell of a beating. But beyond that and a small tattoo of the word summer on the woman's left ankle, nothing had been found with her body that could help them quickly identify her. The autopsy determined that the woman had suffered blunt force trauma to multiple different areas of her body. And due to the state of the bruising left from these injuries, it was believed that she'd been dead for less than 24 hours. But even with the brutality that she'd been through, the medical examiner was able to determine that her actual cause of death had not been her blunt force trauma injuries. Rather that she'd passed away from positional asphyxiation, meaning that she'd been badly beaten eaten and essayed before she was shoved naked and alive into the suitcase where she'd ultimately suffocated after being discarded like a piece of trash. Like how fucking sick and twisted do you have to be to do something like this to another human being? It is appalling. And to 
top it all off, as if everything we've discussed thus far hasn't been abhorrent enough, the autopsy also revealed that the young woman had been roughly five to ten weeks pregnant at the time she was killed. So given that the crime had been committed in Texas, where a fetus is considered its own standalone life, whoever was responsible had just earned themselves a big, fat, capital murder charge for the death of this poor woman and her unborn child. And eventually, after running the woman's fingerprints through APHIS, investigators were able to finally identify their victim as 29-year-old Summer Lee Baldwin. She was raised in New Mexico by her mother, Yuva Roback, who would describe her daughter as bright, loving, and bubbly. Summer had moved to Lubbock when she was 26 years old in order to attend cosmetology school, but she had always made a point to keep in contact with her mother because the two of them were very close. And thanks to Lubbock's small town, everybody knows everybody vibe, police were easily able to track down the people that she was closest with from there as well. And one of the most important people that they spoke to was Summer's good friend, Margie Estrada. Margie was actually one of the last people known to have seen Summer alive when the two of them ran into each other at a 7-Eleven convenience store the night before Summer was killed. And with this information combined with the autopsy information, they were able to determine with some level of certainty that Summer had been murdered on Monday, September 12th. But when and where she had seen Summer was not all that Margie was able to tell investigators. She was also able to give them a description of the vehicle she'd seen her in, as well as the man she had seen her with, which was huge. So apparently at the time she was last known to be alive, Summer had been riding around in a red pickup truck accompanied by an attractive man with short hair. And police were pumped. This was the first real tangible lead that they had to help point their investigation in like any discernible direction. So their next step was not only to identify the mystery man, but also to identify where he and Summer had been. That said, it's not like red pickup truck or cute guy were identifying factors that could drastically narrow down the entire state of Texas or even the city of Lubbock down to a manageable suspect pool. So they most definitely still had their work cut out for them. They decided the best jumping off point would be to review the forensic information that had been taken from the suitcase, considering that and Summer's body were really the only pieces of physical evidence that they had at that point. Now, just as the landfill employee had thought the suitcase was brand new. It still had like the paper stuffing material in it and the fabric on the inside was virtually untouched. But unfortunately, because it was brand new, there was nothing on it forensically or otherwise to help them easily determine whom the luggage may have belonged to. They didn't have fingerprints, they didn't have hair, they didn't have DNA, a completed luggage tag, nothing. The only thing they found inside that they hoped could be of use to them was the UPC tag or the barcode. Obviously this was used for item identification at whatever retailer the bag had been purchased from. And with this UPC tag, they were able to determine not only who manufactured the suitcase, but also where in Lubbock it was available for purchase. As it turned out, this bag was exclusively for sale at Walmart, which was likely going to make tracking down when it was purchased and by who significantly easier and much more straight forward. Instead of having to go here, there, and everywhere to review purchase histories, they simply had to saunter down to the old Walmart and ask for the sales records for that particular suitcase, which is exactly what they did. I don't know why the accent. I promise I won't let it happen again. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's take a quick break. I'm going to throw on my lashes, purge the accent from my system, and when we come back, we'll head to Walmart. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so police head to Walmart, they meet with the asset protection manager, and they review all of the most recent sales of the suitcase. And in doing so, they found two transactions that piqued their interest. They found one from September 12th in the late afternoon around 4 p.m., and one also from September 12th, except it was about 12 hours earlier, around 3.30 a.m., which do you think sounds sketchier. If you guessed the little old lady who had purchased the suitcase around 4 p.m., I'm sorry, but 
you're gonna have to take this one on the chin because she was just innocently shopping for an upcoming family trip. However, the young lad who'd purchased the suitcase at 3 a.m. along with a pack of latex gloves and then drove away in a truck that matched the description that Margie had given police. Yeah, he seemed a little less innocent. And not only did they now know what he looked like, but because this um, criminal mastermind had paid for his murder kit with his own personal credit card, police also knew exactly who he was. Rosendo Rodriguez was a 25-year-old Marine Corps reservist who'd lived in San Antonio since he'd attended Texas Tech University a few years earlier. He'd grown up in Wichita Falls, Texas, and was raised by his mother and his alcoholic domineering father. But despite his less than picturesque upbringing, most people that knew him knew him to be polite, charming, and respectful. He was intelligent and ambitious, and as a child, he even dreamt of becoming the first Hispanic president of the United States. But I guess somewhere along the way, things for Roro went awry, because instead of dabbling in politics, he began assaulting and murdering women. Honestly, potato potato, am I right? Anyways, as investigators began looking into Rosendo, they were pretty quickly able to confirm that over the weekend that Summer had been killed, he had definitely been in Lubbock for military training. They also learned that despite his ability to have stayed at a hotel with the rest of the Marine reservists, Rosendo had made a point to seclude himself at a completely separate hotel about 10 miles away. And this hotel, this Holiday Inn, just so happened to be directly across the street from the 7-Eleven that Margie had seen Summer at just hours before her death. Dun dun dun. So now that police have finally determined where Summer's murder most likely took place, they made their way to the Holiday Inn in hopes of salvaging any possible remaining evidence. And luckily when they got there, they were surprised to find that the room barely looked like it had been cleaned, which is that shade to Holiday Inn? Maybe. But in this case, it worked out pretty well. So I guess you got to take the good with the bad. Police were able to identify bloodstains on the carpet, the mattress, and the bedspread. They also found the Walmart bag in the trash can, and it had a pair of used latex gloves in it. Oh, and they even found the Walmart receipt for the purchase of the suitcase and the gloves. Seriously, the Hotel Motel Holiday Inn turned out to be a gold mine of evidence. And through forensic comparison, they were able to very quickly confirm that the blood samples taken from the hotel room had in fact come from Summer. So this confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had definitely been attacked in that very room. They were able to pull two DNA profiles from the discarded latex gloves. The DNA they pulled from the outside of the gloves was a match to Summer, and the DNA they pulled from the inside of the gloves, presumably left by whoever had worn the gloves, well, ultimately that DNA would be proven to be a match to, um, you guessed it, Rosendo Rodriguez. By the time the arrest warrant was issued for Rosendo, he was back home in San Antonio, just kicking it at his parents' house. So detectives made the six hour trip from Lubbock to San Antonio to finally arrest this man. And when he was taken into custody, he didn't really seem upset and he didn't really seem surprised. He actually didn't even ask what he was being arrested for in the first place, which police felt was pretty incriminating in and of itself. Following his arrest, police went ahead and executed a search warrant on his residence where they recovered the shirt he'd been wearing during his late night shopping trip to Walmart. And they also took his computer in for forensic examination. <laughs> and um, it certainly did not help his case. I will tell you that much. Actually, I'm gonna tell you everything because it's literally why I'm here. But for starters, investigators found that upon returning home from San Antonio, Roro had started feverishly monitoring the news in Lubbock, making sure he knew everything there was to know about the investigation into Summer's murder. But that wasn't all. <laughs> no, no. He was also making sure to catch up on everything there was to know about another investigation as well. And as I'm pretty sure you've probably guessed by now, he 
was indeed looking into the investigation of the 2004 disappearance of Joanna Rogers. Obviously, this looks bad for Rosendo, sure, but you can't arrest someone because of their Google history, and <laughs> thank God, because my Google history is fucked up, but you get what I'm saying. They couldn't arrest him just for Googling stuff about Joanna's disappearance. Well, I mean, they'd already arrested him for Summer's murder, but they couldn't start slapping him with charges pertaining to Joanna without, like, some more concrete evidence. Luckily for them, they were able to quickly link him to Joanna based on his cell phone records. Because on the night Joanna went missing, Rosendo had made two separate phone calls to her. The calls were made about 15 minutes apart, which made police speculate that the first call was to extend an invitation to Joanna to meet up with him, and that the second call was to likely let her know that he'd arrived at her house to pick her up. Now, even though police felt like they were definitely onto something here as far as Rosenda and Joanna went, they knew that they still had way more evidence linking him to Summer's murder than they did to Joanna's disappearance. So they decided to approach him with that first. And he was actually fairly quick to agree to tell them his side of the story of what had happened that night. So according to Rosendo, he and Summer had met up that night and he had driven her to his hotel room where the two of them consensually engaged in some activities you might expect two adults to engage in in the privacy of a hotel room. However, following the eggs, um, Roro claimed that Summer had attempted to attack him with a pocket knife. So in self-defense, obviously, he'd gotten Summer into a headlock and he'd proceeded to strangle and beat her until she was unconscious to protect himself from a pocket knife. Seriously, give me your honest opinion down below. When these people are telling these stories, do you think that it's like a Hail Mary or do you think that they're sitting there like, it's perfect, they'll totally buy it. Do you think that they're really arrogant enough to sit there and think that this shit sounds legitimate or are they just desperate to come up with an explanation? Cause I honestly can't decide what I think. I can tell you for certain that the police were <laughs> definitely not buying it. The forensic evidence in the hotel just did not match up to what he was claiming had happened. Not to mention that he's claiming to have narrowly survived a knife fight with Summer, but he had nary a defensive wound on his body. But nevertheless, he was sticking to his story that he'd accidentally killed her and that he decided instead of calling police and letting them know what had transpired, he decided he'd go to Walmart, get a suitcase and a box of gloves so that he could literally throw this poor woman away. He tried to explain that he didn't call police because he was concerned about what the whole situation would do to his military career, but I think we all know that that's likely just another weak ass excuse. Regardless of his explanation, it really didn't matter because with the admission of what he'd done, police were able to inform him officially that there was a good chance he could be looking at the death penalty if he decided to take his story to trial. However, with that said, the district attorney was willing to drop the capital murder charge he was looking at for killing Summer and her unborn child to life in prison, but only if he would tell them where they could find Joanna's remains. I do want to clarify here that not only was Summer's mother okay with this, she was 100% like totally for it. She wanted to do whatever she possibly could to help Joanna's family find the closure that they so desperately wanted and deserved. So with Yuva's blessing, Rosendo was offered a plea agreement. Life in prison instead of the death penalty in exchange for his cooperation in locating Joanna. And this was an offer that Rosendo couldn't refuse. He quickly jumped at the opportunity to save his own life. In his official statement, Rosendo claimed that after chatting with Joanna online for a while, the two made plans to meet up, which they did in the early morning hours of May 4th, 2004. He claimed that after he picked them up, the two had consensual sex in the backseat of his truck and that after they were done, Joanna informed him that she was actually much younger than she led him to believe and that she planned to blackmail him with what had just happened. And upon hearing this, he panicked and in 
self-defense, he ended up killing her almost exactly the same way that he would later kill Summer. And I've gotta say, for being like a big bad Marine, he was apparently really spooked by these petite young women. Now, here's the fucked up part. I mean, the whole thing is fucked up, but the next part is just like, wow. So after accidentally murdering Joanna, Rosendo took her back to his apartment where he concealed her in a black suitcase and he threw her in a dumpster. Meaning that somewhere buried under 29 months of trash in the same landfill the Summer Baldwin's body had been discovered, encased in a nearly identical suitcase tomb, lay the remains of 16-year-old Joanna Rogers. As the community found out what had happened to Joanna, volunteers turned out to search by hand in the Texas heat through the tons and tons of garbage at the landfill. They searched day in and day out for five straight days before finally poor Joanna's skeletal remains were discovered enclosed in a suitcase in the Lubbock City landfill over two years after she'd initially disappeared. This finally brought some peace and some closure to her friends and family who'd been pining for her return all this time. Now, that should kind of be it, shouldn't it? Both girls had been found and returned to their families and lovingly laid to rest, and their killer has admitted his guilt and is behind bars for the rest of his life. Right? Wrong. Because when it came time for Rosendo to formally enter his guilty plea, he stood in court in front of the judge, the DA, the girls' families, J Jesus and everybody, and had the audacity to pretend that he didn't understand why he was even standing there. He didn't understand what was going on, and he didn't understand his plea agreement. And when the DA was like, bro, what the fuck did you just say? Rosendo's attorney explained that his client did not have the mental capacity to enter a guilty plea, which obviously voided the agreement they'd made to not seek the death penalty. So the DA announced right then and there that they would in fact be seeking the death penalty. The problem with this was that without Rosendo's confession to Joanna's murder, which was now inadmissible in court due to the dissolution of the plea agreement he'd made the confession for, they didn't really have a lot of evidence that they could present to a jury to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he had murdered Joanna. So ultimately they made the decision to try him solely for Summer's murder, a decision that Joanna's family was aware of. And following this trial, the jury barely deliberated for an hour before they returned to the courtroom and found Rosendo guilty of killing Summer Baldwin and her unborn child. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection in early 2008. And after his legal team had exhausted all of their appeals, Rosendo Rodriguez was executed via lethal injection on March 27th, 2018, just one day after he turned 38 years old. When given the opportunity to make one final statement, Rosendo droned on for over seven minutes, and not surprisingly, he used none of this time to apologize to Summer or Joanna's families. Instead, he stated, quote, the state may have my body, but they never had my soul. I want everyone to boycott every single business in the state of Texas until all the businesses are pressed to stop the death penalty. I've fought the good fight. I have run the good race. Warden, I'm ready to join my father, unquote. And while yes, justice was served and yes, the families have closure, it still doesn't bring back Summer and Joanna. It doesn't heal the hurt that they feel on a daily basis, and it doesn't give them back all of the opportunities that this absolute piece of shit took away from them. And it is so scary to think that if he hadn't made the teeny tiny mistake of leaving the barcode on the suitcase, not only would these two murders probably still be unsolved, but I'd almost be willing to bet that there would be more women out there that would have lost their lives to this horrible, trash goblin of a man. Anyways, I guess with that, we're about wrapped for today. Rest in peace to Joanna and Summer. I hope that their families have found some semblance of peace over the years 
following these tragedies. And I hope knowing that the monster who took their lives can't hurt anyone else ever again brings them the closure they deserve. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notifications. I put out new videos every week and I'd love to catch you back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.